Okay, uh, let me do the next slide here, continuing this overview. At the heart of the Grusky Whedon model is the exploration of the importance of disaggregated occupations that explain a wide range of phenomena that are also studied using conventional blah, blah. Okay, that's bullshit. Okay, so for right one possible... <laughs> Sorry, I had somebody put their dick in my mouth. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, okay, let's just skip to the next point. Like one criticism that Wright have of their work is the use of the term class, albeit with the prefix micro. Why not just use the more transparent term occupation and frame it as occupational analysis? What do people make of that? I kind of, I kind of, I kind of agree with that. I think. I 100% agree with everything that Wright says. He's like, yeah, it would make more sense to call it occupation, but I'm not going to quibble about terminology. Let's just move on. Like, 100% agree with all of that. Because there's a broader point and more interesting things to say about this than to quibble about the terminology. But I, what Wright is, make, is, is pointing to the ideological point that yes. the reason that they're using class in it's this to, way is to try to take the piss out of class. Yeah, or, or yeah, to focus on something they think is more important, which obscures. Right. Or to obscure class, yeah. It, to obscure class. It, and it, it, is a, it is not a, a, a completely insignificant point, but there is something more interesting happening with their, their model that mm -hmm. is more mm -hmm. worth talking about. However, and, and that right is more interesting than doing Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think most yeah. Marxists would stop there at the idea, ideology. Can't you see that this is ideology? It doesn't matter that it is true or predictive. It, 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 you know, like, like as if, like, uh, you know, Malthus Malthusian population models weren't ideology and science at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, like or, or or Marx's old point about the economics textbooks of his day, right? Where it's just like the, it's like the the idealist socialists are like argue the claim that the the economics textbooks are like totally just like like totally just made up, and Marx's whole point is like as you know it's like oh like they, they're so naive as though they think the problem is that the textbooks are wrong right where he's like no it's like the right. the issue with the textbooks is simultaneously that they are accurate to a certain state of affairs but that the purposes for which you even established the entire analytical framework is ideological right like that there's certain things that they want to be able to know and understand about capitalism and there's certain things that they don't it's it's not it's not that they're just made up it's that they could simultaneously be ideological and and accurate. In fact, in fact, simultaneously be ideological and factual, like the algorithm argument of centrists. It's right. about it's like jazz. It's about the notes you don't play. So okay. or if you're John, if you're, if you're John Coltrane, it's the extra four thousand notes you play. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Gruski and Whedon's model of class is animated by a very general question: What is it about a person's location within a si within a system of production that best explains? The sorts of things theorists of class have always wanted to explain. Life chances, income, political attitudes and behavior, cultural tastes, etc. There must be, they reason, something about the homogeneity, homogeneity of interests, of experiences and other conditions connected to a location that generates homogeneity of these outcomes. Most sociologists see this homogeneity as generated within big classes. Grusky Whedon argued that this homogenization, homogenization, Christ Almighty, I worked in a creamery with a homogenizer for milk and I can't, oh, yeah. I can't even say <laughs> that. When I think about homogenization, I literally think about mixing milk and cream. Like it's the first thing that comes to my mind. It's a good metaphor. Yeah, mine too, it, actually. It, yeah, yeah. The, the farmers co op that my father worked in, I used to work in, uh, they were the only place left in Ireland that produced non homogenized milk. There you go. Oh, wow. oh dang. As long as because it's pasteurized, man. well, it's pasteurized, but but you see, homogenized. You break when you homogenize, you break yeah, up yeah, the milk and the fat so much that the cream takes longer to congeal, and it takes longer for the milk to go sour. So that's why everything is homogenized. Mm. Uh, oh. so uh, I actually didn't know that part. That's I didn't cool. know that either. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it, our our milk would like go off in about three days, and a normal milk would go off in about a week. There you go. That's okay. Mm. Oh, wow. But apparently, it's better for your heart non-homogenized milk because the fat gets it, it's easier for your stomach to process it away and it doesn't oh. go into your bloodstream as much there you go Learn oh new it, that makes sense it, it probably is very easy to get emulsified when it's right. just in clumps like that there you go okay sorry last point most sociolog most sociologists see this homo homogeneity as generated within big classes grusky whedon however argue that this 
homo oh Jesus, homogenization operates much more intensively at the level of detailed occupations. Like, I have no problems with any of this. Like, I can imagine that's true. I can imagine it's also not true at certain stages in history when material conditions cause what you were talking about, Bob, earlier, these disaggregation and reaggregations, yeah. and that they can be overwhelmed by the reaggregation effect. I, you know, and I, you know, I would, you know, I think that sounds pretty straightforward. And anybody have anything to say on this, or have we covered it already? I think the only thing I can add is that if you can't pronounce homogeneity, just call it big homo and move on. So most yeah. sociologists yeah. see this big homo as generated <laughs> in big classes. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless, you're, unless you're Lacanian <laughs> or Delusian, and then you have to, you know, the, your starting point is that there is no such thing as the big homo. Yeah. Well, there we go. Well, what is there? well, they're just wrong. Shh, don't don't <laughs> tell anybody. We we need to grift <laughs> off of them, and oh, we're fighting big lomo homo by doing it, so you don't have to or, or something. I'm fighting know. big homo. I'm I'm trying to get down with big homo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course, honey. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're you know leading the fight. We're putting in our Patreon. We know that Ber the Bernie Sanders campaign died, and and the, so did the Corbin one, and all our strategies are garbage. So we need we need all the money we can get. We're you know I don't know. I'm on the Jacobin train, babe. I'm trying let's, to set up a. Let's throw in with the far right and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, let's... and fight big homo and, and yeah. Be, yeah. I'm gonna be a red trad wife. There we go. I'm trying to get railed in a sundress this summer. That's right. It's very important. <laughs> like anyway, I don't know. I... If you if you position yourself against big homo, you know you might get some extra Patreon bucks over the next you know ten Birth years. Birth control. Who needs that? I'm trying to fucking <laughs> shoot up. Red diaper babies. Yeah, you need to keep up with population. That's very, right. Very important stuff. Anyway, back to Malthus, right? Ezri, do you want to take this next slide then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually I like, didn't I like say things I mean I, instead. Yeah. I I actually I actually didn't put in any of the global homo stuff in the slides. I kind of left that stuff out. I thought the chapter what? I didn't know I didn't really understand. Like the relevance of it in the chapter. <laughs> well, yeah, just in the middle of the it's, chapter, it's, it's right? Completely important. Like, yeah, it's kind of. It does seem a little like off base. He starts ranting about the PMC promoting big global homo and trying to, you know, brainwash it's all the kind kids of in the into middle. being trans. Yeah, I wasn't sure what that had to do with anything. I think it was just to sell books. Yeah. Um, R.I.P. Eric Olin Wright. So the Grusky Whedon microclass model. All right. One of my favorite things I, I ever said on air is that I, I just said that Robert Brenner's description of capitalism uh, is actually motivi motivated by a deep racial hatred of the English. That was, that was fun. I didn't feel bad about that one. Felt, felt fun bad fun about and that. accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so the Grusky Whedon microclass model. The pivotal concept within this approach to class is occupation. For Grusky... The starting point for modern Durkheimian analysis is the unit occupation, which is defined as a group of technically similar jobs that are institutionalized in the labor market through such means as an association or union, licensing or certification requirements, or widely diffused understandings among employers, workers, and others regarding efficient or otherwise preferred ways of organizing production and dividing labor. So yeah, so one, some associations, two, some kind of credentialing, three, widely diffused understandings regarding efficiency or organization or production. The unit occupations are often generated through jurisdictional struggles between competing groups over functional niches in the division of labor. Occupation defined this way is for Grusky and Whedon, a realist category that defines a person's location within a system of production the categories are institutionalized in the actual practices of employers and associations. They are not simply analytical categories produced by academics. They see the reliance of invented analytical categories by most sociologists as one of the failings of class analysis that focuses exclusively on big classes. Just to, just to sort of respond to what we've been discussing, this realist category and this emphasis on I would say it's essentially a type of empiricism more than it is just positivism. Because a lot of Marxists are very positivist about their class analysis. It's just that they make these hard assumptions and work from there. This is an attempt to look at things that pop out at you in the world, I guess. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to bring up was in regards to three, I think what I thought of 
with three is I, I thought back to when I was working at Taco Bell, right? Or Subway when I worked fast food. This is the widely diffused understandings. Yeah, but I don't know if widely diffused understandings is like an accurate term, but yeah. maybe a more accurate way to put it is like kind of the ways employers structure their training and their like monitoring regimes in order to maximize efficiency and the ways workers in response try to undermine that. There's a shared cultural niche that you kind of gain working in fast food in America. For instance, like there's like very, you know, kind of strict and long training actually at Taco Bell. That's like a lot of computer modules that, and, and like quizzes you have to do more, more than I thought there would be. And then, you know, fast forward a couple months later, my shift shift lead is like putting a metal fucking lid on the end of a broomstick and waving it in front of the sensor at the drive through to make our drive through times go down. <laughs> So that way we don't like get in trouble with our boss and with the franchise owner. Yeah, but I think I think what Wright is referring to is more maybe you would think of as bootlickers, right? Like people that have that behave in accordance with this ideological understanding. So people who actually follow the rules of the talk about training, basically. Yeah, more or less. I don't know. Am I wrong? Like, does that? Seem I mean, right? if that's what if that's, that's a kind right of anybody else thing that you know Gretzky and Whedon are, are talking about their conception of, of this is 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 isn't realist at all I would say I mean th- there's a lot of industries where people especially before the labor market shortage change like uh, the, you know the four changes in the labor market I met a great number of people who are extremely grateful for their jobs no matter what they are and did, did not kind of yeah those people always exist, but when I was working at Taco Bell, this was 10 years ago. Yeah. This was well before the, the kind of shift in labor market. And I mean, I suppose, like, regardless of how somebody... It depends on the labor. It yeah. depends yeah. on yeah. the type of labor more. Surely it, dep- yeah, it surely would depend a bit on, like, what you have to gain by internalizing, right. you know, management's understanding of the work process. And so it's like, I think that, like, and this might be a place where like, you know, you sort of see this move from like micro class to like maybe larger classes where it's like, if you're working fast food, right, there's mm-hmm. very little material reason for you to internalize, right? right. Like for most people to internalize um, right. like management or the owner classes understanding of what you do, which might be a little bit different than if you're like, I don't know, like you work in a a, a middle management type of position mm-hmm. in a different yeah. industry where like you are Absolutely. where you don't own capital but like there's you you see the pos- the possibilities for like oh maybe one day i'll own a house or maybe i'll get a promotion or maybe i'll do this you know like and so um there's going to be a lot of variation right like how much like like gramsci's whole argument around fordism the rise of fordism right was like that like the industrial auto automotive working class was going to gain certain types of benefits from an era of high mass consumption within their position that, that, that made it more feasible for them to go along with a class compromise after like management had liquidated all the communists from their unions. Right. Like, but that's very different. I think than like, Oh, I'm working in like, you know, like I'm, I'm making minimum wage or close to that. I've got no job security. And I'm also living in a system in which my like pensions and minimum wage and, you know, like pensions and everything are being constantly clawed back. Right. So it's like, I guess it's very, I guess it's very relational. I guess like the analysis has to be very relational. Yeah. Right? And so, so internalizing this management understanding is probably related to how much room for advancement you see yourself having. Probably. I don't know. I think like, how, just how, the, how much is the, housing cost at the particular I, period of time? What are the, you know, like. Being in a bunch of arts industries, there are people that were just like not getting paid, just like fucking going into a hole that were like, oh, I'm so lucky to be here. You know, like I've seen a lot of like, weird maladaptive shit that rhymes with this and it probably you know it, it, it has to be highly relational it makes sense that probably the only person at the taco bell that thinks that way is someone who wants to be the manager my shift lead was the one who taught me the thing with the metal <laughs> the metal lid on the end of the broomstick to make the sensor time go down maybe that's a wide maybe that's the widely diffused understanding that is very yeah that is why diffused like, like if, I'm if, sure. if, if, if that was your shift lead mm-hmm. doing it then that, he was definitely breaking the rules, but he was definitely motivated to make those numbers look good. Talk- 
for his boss. We're talking about positivism. We're talking about positivism here. <laughs> it's like the the stick and the metal as positivism for the uh, for the company. That's data, to understand baby. How things work. Yeah, but the, the other thing I would say is, well, it, no, it's not purely. I, I, I understand what you're saying. All of you is about the different kind of relational stuff and all that, but it's also like it fundamentally exploits people's kind of people. Lots of people have like pride in their work, mm. you know. <laughs> they, they like doing a good job. It also like and like whether that's bootlicking. I don't even. I think you can have pride in your work even no. not be a bootlicker. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no, no. That, that's of, of course I so. believe that. Yeah. I just think that when you are constantly taken advantage of, and eventually you're faced with a choice: is to continue being taken advantage of and kind of taken on the chin and justify it, or to kind of become resentful about it. You, you can have pride in a job well done, but no one likes being taken advantage of. Yeah. I know, but people put up with these things. Like I just talk about my mother worked in a local bakery and she wasn't being treated right for a, for for quite a long time. She worked there fucking twenty years before she jacked it in. People, I mean, people listen, do that kind I'm, of. I'm not, I'm not calling your mom a bootlicker. I'm just saying that, like, based on the what Sophia was yeah. saying about Taco Bell, you know, like, and how little of a shit all the people cared there, then it like. I think the phenomenon that is like broadly kind of, I don't know, distributed throughout the economy that Krusky and Whedon are talking about probably is more visible at Walmart or something where it's, it's similarly right. shit, but there is like, oh, there is some real hardcore like ideology going on. And no, that's true. I'll bet you a lot of Walmart Work workers. Target. Yeah. Right. Tar I saw that at Target. And there was some, there was some. You saw the anti-union propaganda. You went into it. I, I but... got shown anti-union propaganda and I don't know why. I don't know how they could tell. Right. I don't know that I did have a conversation about social democracy with some like cute little. I was like eighteen, so I was yeah. still thinking in terms of like preps and and jocks and punks. Sure, sure. This cute little preppy blonde girl and I were talking about social democracy, and I was like surprised she was interested in that stuff. And then, sure as shit, her and I were sitting in the anti-union propaganda fucking video and. You don't even talk about unions. Damn communist synthesizers. synthesizers. Damn communist synthesizers. <laughs> um, but there was also these guys who who were just workers there who were like, this is during the Bush era, who were like super into like defending neoconservatism and like, you know, I remember having conversations about like how they think that like Rise Against new music video about global warming was bullshit and they like the one better where they're running around like breaking shit and spray painting walls and with respect to the class content of Rise Against, like I, I guess what I'm saying is more their attitudes towards unionization. Yeah, well, unionization yeah. and and loyalty, they were bootlickers to the employers, the the management as well. Okay, there, there we go. That's the that's it. That's the relevance. Yeah, but Rise Against, right? Yeah, for Rise Against. You know, they they didn't even like the art of drowning. That's that's hard right to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, anyway. <laughs> Um, I think I finished the slide. Oh, okay, here we go. People answer the question, what do you do by naming an occupation? None of this is true for big classes, although they do respond with their class if they are asked that question. The big classes, and that's Sorry, a parent that, that's, that's just I'm me. That's, that's from yeah, that's Tom, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, in the United States, it's, that's, you know, but it's people a real crapshoot whether someone is, is like super woke on property relations. I was also going to say, like, like in North America, people, I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but like every, like there's been a lot of, there's a lot of studies done on this. People massively misidentify their class position, mm -hmm. um, not yeah. even in a Marxist sense, but even in a kind of like, sort of more like liberal or, or, or kind of mainstream sense of like, where are you in the income distribution? Like wealthier, mm -hmm. like upper middle class people, all, everyone thinks they're middle class because like mm -hmm. middle class is like a is a floating signifier of extreme ideological importance in North American politics. So it's like people who are actually like working class, or if you want to base it on like a kind of non-Marxist income, like lower class, they think they're middle class. And then unless you are like, like utter, like just like staggeringly wealthy, all of these, like all these people who are actually like the top one to 5% of income distribution think they're middle class, right? Like yeah, everyone yeah. is middle class. And like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, like one of the wildest things about Sanders, right, was that in the States was that like he was actually talking about the working class and no one had talked about that in American politics for 40 years. Right. Like, I mean, uh, including Bernie Sanders for like 20 years, like yeah, that's right. started saying the middle class instead of the working class. And that's right. Yeah. Be a Democratic senator. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 
another interesting kind of foundational story is like when my family moved up a, a little bit in income distribution, you know, I had a friend who was like a little bit poorer than, to, than me. And like, he thought of himself as because we were having this conversation and like, you could see the differences in our homes and in our lifestyles. Only then did he describe himself and his family as lower middle class. Mm. And I describe myself as middle class. Right. Because if you're the benchmark for middle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Tom maybe in a place with kind of more Marxist inspired history like Ireland, that there might be better diffuse like class understandings, even like English, yeah. like a, a lot of places in the English, like Commonwealth, like former, you know, British Empire, like have a much clearer uh, view of class relations. That's true. To that is true. They like, yeah, like we, we never had a, but and, I think, you know, I, but this I think doesn't more, go for Canada, but in the US, we, you know, didn't even really have a Labour Party to yeah. speak of. Sorry, I was, was going to say, but I think more of kind of fundamentally, like if we think that the point that being made here is like, what do you do? Like that, the, it's the you. You wouldn't expect somebody to say I'm a working class by that. It's like the wrong question. Like I, I just I know yeah. that's a kind of pernickety thing, but I know what you mean. On top of it, like in America, there is no working class. It's only middle class, and that's everybody. Yeah. You know, yeah. you cannot and, ideologically use the word working class. And in, in Canada, the right populace who are mm. like, taking over the Conservative Party, interested enough, they have been the ones. So like, and this is a, I mean, another example of how it's like trying to understand of like 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 the temporality of these sorts of claims, right? Like in what what particular moments in capitalism under a particular regime in a particular place is, is one aspect of the analysis more salient than the other, right? Because like now that everything is in crisis in Canada, the right populists are talking about the working class. Right. And it's actually like the liberal party that wants to keep talking about the middle class because they see the middle class as like their basis of support. So it's like, it's, it's the far right people who like came up interesting enough under like Koch brother funded Canadian think tanks who are like now out there talking about like how they're going to like help the working class. And now they're going to help the working class is like deregulate crypto and, uh, yeah, right. and, well, and, and like, yeah. and like defund uh, the welfare state. Right. Like, yeah. Cause it's a crypto nationalist dog whistle. And unfortunately yeah. like class politics in the 20th century, like slides into this reactionary form that they want, that they can recall much more easier, much easier than, you know, communists there, there's a similar trend in, in the u.s as well um yeah. it's a little bit more diffusing kind of bong rip with the role that QAnon plays here and like the kind of like populist takeover is, is trump and trump is just a user yeah but i would say like earlier like in the 90s or something if anyone was talking about workers they were comparing it to like welfare state like people that mm. were benefiting from the welfare state and trying to attack those parasites they weren't saying it in quotes they weren't using that worker's identity to attack the bourgeoisie. That, that's like, also pretty- kind of like the, the Rennick Revolt thing that that we were trying to do is that you saw a lot of, there's kind of this like thin slice of like using income distribution kind of lingo, like lower middle class, you know, kind of like skilled workers, people who are like mechanics and, and service worker, uh, like people who service like machinery and stuff like that, who tend to cut kind of right actually because they see themselves themselves as being threatened by taxes and welfare uh, recipients as taking up resources that they're trying desperately to hold on to whereas people who are lower than them only benefit from these these kinds of services so yeah and uh, redneck revolt was an anti-fascist group you were part of that practiced this differentiated appeal right of, and of this anti-fascist like so you go, to, so we would go to like gun shows, and you would see people who are pr- probably genuinely like working class, throwing in with these petite bourgeois people about you know Hillary, Cl- you know Hillary Clinton is a is an evil cunt or whatever kind of discourse that we actually kind of agreed with them on, but also like so is the right wing candidate you favor <laughs> as well. Anyway. So I'm I'm gonna just go ahead and endorse that there's an empirical resonance that occupation has that the big classes don't in times when I guess there there isn't like tumult over the food supply or yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like I, but it, but like 1968 in France, there was no tumult over food supply, so it's not necessarily just food supply. No, you're right. But there was a government that rose and fall, like rose and fell in like you know living memory that was 
that was beholden to the Nazis and then a bunch of them were rehabilitated. Like there was a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, reasons in, in that case, it wasn't like famine. It was more like political instability and war that set that up. Like the French government was like falling every couple of decades. You know what I mean? <laughs> was, was it? But de Gaulle was quite stable in his power though. Wasn't he not? He like, was stable enough to, to, <laughs> yeah, well he, he was stable enough to, to withstand May 68, but you know, he fled, you know what I mean? They, there was a point where it looked like that wasn't the case. So I guess to change my thesis a little bit, it's not just hunger, but it's any of the you know violent destabilizers, you know, war. Or say, uh, or say like uh, like uh, the end of like like it can be it can be political crisis too. Like say it can be, the it can be political Portuguese, crisis, but... you know, Portuguese yeah. revolution. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess I'm, revolution. You know, like I'm, I think I'm, it, I think I'm we borrowing should some analysis. I'm borrowing some analysis from a book called The Great Leveler that talks about. Uh, reduction of social inequality being tied to big violent events like you know famines uh pestilence like diseases uh revolutions or wars uh that's where i'm coming from here uh, but yeah so just to reform my thoughts yes it can be political instability that brings people there but i mean what i i think i think while you bring up a good point Esri, i think also the the point that tom brings up with that parenthetical is is somewhat fair it's like a, it's a basic research research methods kind of point or like critique mm -hmm. of research methods like what kind of question are you asking is going to determine what kind of answer you get and doesn't yeah. eric olin right know it yeah uh his his I don't, middle period is all in is all sort of like developing a concept of, of class that's sort of like a nine location grid and then doing all this empirical research on mm -hmm. it and trying and he does broadly he does broadly think that there are like political correlates to class relation understood in a marxist way they're just they're you know they're sort of weak well i think also and correct me if i'm wrong but i think that parenthetical is taking aim at gretzky and whedon and not right correct yeah right that's sure. that, yeah, yeah that's what i meant by it yeah 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 well any Marxist can say, you know, the, the empirical resonance of the class is not, or, and, you know, what resonates with the class as people is not necessarily their world historical interests hovering above them in some sense. <laughs> There's a, that's just a basic Marxist problem, I suppose. We're never going to be completely satisfied by an appeal to what the, you know, what people in the class think, but it's, I don't know. I'll defend this interest in, in people that you're trying to aggregate and what they think, like from, from sociological perspective. I may not I'm agree hearing, with your, your, your conscious class interests, but I I will fight to to, to the right to death to, 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 for you to have it. If you don't incorporate people's actual thoughts into your theory of class consciousness, you're just doing some totalitarian Hegelian game. I, I, no, I I agree. I, I I think just taking this at face value, Gretzky and Whedon would get a question an answer that's more class based if they asked, <laughs> yeah, what class do you identify with instead of what do you do? But yeah, I guess. But I, I agree with a lot. What the, the, the general sort of social relevance. What class do you come from? Is not a question I hear like between just people. And what do you do? Is something I hear all the time. Unless you're in college and somebody say, "What class did you come from?" Say, "Oh, I came from the class that's down the corridor, one A, <laughs> class one A. I'm going to class two C now." Unless, you, yeah, yeah, unless but, you're a weirdo yeah, like no. me, you'd be like, "Oh, I guess I'm I'm working class and I was middle class." People are like, "What?" Yeah, <laughs> right. What? I do think I do think Tom has a point too that people do know, like people know how to answer that question, right? Even if even if they, as I said, they often misidentify where they like like where they actually yeah. are. It's not like people aren't aware of that, right? Like it's not like people aren't aware that there's like something called middle class and working class and upper class, and now people talk about the one percent, right? Like and the right, they talk about globalists and so on, which like often means like the Jews, but also has a class yeah. identity, right? And so it's like people, it's not that people aren't actually invested in their sense of where they are in a class hierarchy, because I actually I think broadly speaking, they very much are. Right. It's they're not just they don't just think of themselves as within an occupation. And the idea of becoming work a middle class or maintaining a middle class status continues to have ex an extreme level of uh, socio like ideological salience that, that 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 exceeds what the kind of shade that Gresky and Whedon are throwing as though it's like only sociologists that think about class. I mean, right. that's like, come on, that's horseshit, right? No, like even, horseshit. even, However, even the like, basic <laughs> interaction with people outside of academia demonstrates that that's not true. Sure, but, but, but right. people are often correct about their 
professional interests because it stems yes. from their everyday life experience and yes. what it means to butter their bread. And they're usually fucking wrong about their long-term class interests. That's correct. Like, yes. In a way that Absolutely. Marxists will be like, actually, I'd like, I've derived the perfect formula from, you know, German mm, metaphysics me. to, to actually explain to you your real class. You know, like there's a whole different dynamic because classes is, is just a remote abstraction from those real life, the, like the real thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, th and that, that's what makes it just consciously follow less from sensuous activity as Marx imagined. You know, when you're seeing a workers' movement pop up as Marx was, it was kind of easy to think, well, shit, these huge determinants of life chances, that's going to be the huge determinant of consciousness. That's a nice, clear theory. And that, it makes sense for its time. It makes sense for its time. It has faith in human reason to kind of deduce their, you know, their better angels of their nature, in a sense, to not just go in with their, you know, basis, short-term interests, but to have a more expansive view of their interests. And, you know, Marx is maybe a little optimistic. Well, and well, I, I, yeah, I think the thing that the damning thing that happened was that, you know, the state clamped down on the workers movement. And and in America, you, it was made illegal to be a, a communist or an anarchist in, a, in the union. And I, I don't think that changed. I just have one uh, comment from uh, Guillaume in the uh, in the chat that the Portuguese revolution was because of a colonial war, among the other factors, but it was the trigger. Yeah, so the, it's right. like a, it's kind of like war was definitely in the mix yeah. there. Yeah, it was like Choc Mozambique. Choc wasn't it? Yeah. Choc one up for the great leveler. Was it Mo um, Mozambique? Was it or was it uh, Ango oh, Angola? Is it Angola or Mozambique? Was the war? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, okay. I don't know about Portuguese imperialism. I know one um, thing they did. The Portuguese they listened to how scummy this is. In uh, I think it was I think it was Mozambique when they left as a punishment. What they did they filled the sewers full of concrete in the capital city oh god oh. yeah i heard that now so somebody can can yeah, uh, correct me if i'm wrong about that but uh, yeah i did I, I have read that somewhere that's <laughs> pretty grim Something revolting all right so now that we've solved class versus occupation and its empirical re resonance we can move on the big classes remain analytical abstractions created by the theoretical reasoning of analysts rather than the categories that are formally institutionalized in the protocols of organizations and the everyday practices and understanding of real people. They argue that disaggregated occupations constitute the real boundaries of locations within production that have sufficient internal homogeneity to generate the outcomes of interest to class analysis. Quote, Occupations act collectively on behalf of their members, extract rent and exploit non-members, shape life chances and lifestyles, and otherwise behave precisely as class theorists have long thought aggregate classes should. Using their definition, there are perhaps thousands of microclasses in a large complex society. In their research, they differentiated 126 occupations, that number limited by the data that they were using. They even suggested that academic sociologists and economists constitute two different microclasses. So Agreed. one thing, like, you know, we did just read the Brumaire, like God knows how long ago, two years ago, we finished reading the Brumaire or a year ago. Don't say it's to you, to Jesus, Tom. Well, what did we do? <laughs> We've done another one since the Brumaire. Didn't we do something in between the Brumaire and this? Uh, you did the Fundamental Principles series, but I think... Oh, maybe that was it. Yeah. So, like, but in the Brumaire, like, Marx talks, you know that where he talks about, like, the, the people acting as their, like, big class and then going like fuck this lads <laughs> and essentially devolving into their micro classes yeah you know? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah there's kind and, of like game theory problem there where you're like abandoning your big coalition like, right yeah you're gonna go oh this shit's not gonna work this time yeah fuck it and people make rational well, choices to to act as the micro classes like marx describes all the you know you know that's the thing like you know i i feel this is so congruent in the good sense that eo right manages to construct it i find it very congruent with like a marxist class analysis mm -hmm. yeah yeah, it, yeah. To it totally is well and like putting it in that like game metaphor kind of terminology mm -hmm. like when at one point you're finding like well the, this this capitalist game we're playing is like so fucked up and unfair let's let's play this this communist game or the socialist game instead that's way better when you keep trying to change the game and you fail then you know you move to the micro classes eventually and be like ah fuck it i'm just gonna you know, try to win at this at the game we have instead, or focus on the moves I can make within this game because I can't fucking change the shit. 
It's literally what we do when we're talking on this podcast all the time. We say, oh, wait for the workers movement to arise. Yeah, so what the fuck can we do in the meantime? <laughs> you know, yeah, talk well, some theory bullshit, you know? To, to be optimistic about this microclass analysis or something like, workers acting rationally within their own situation, you know, not assuming that everything is going to change, but just kind of acting, trying to act in their own best interests would be a welcome would be something of like a welcome improvement to workers just getting fleeced on an individual level. You know, I have a friend who is in like middle management, not exactly a worker, but over the, you know, over the years, in the beginning of the pandemic, he's very grateful for his job. At the end of the pandemic, he was like, man, fuck this job. <laughs> like yeah. the, j- jobs are bullshit. Capitalism's destroying the world. Ended up having this sort of sea change that was sort of pretty painful for him because it was at, at odds with what, you know, what he had to do for his everyday life experience. Anyway, I suppose my my overall point is that like, there's an old Marxist theory that goes something like this. If you can get like worker struggles to adopt kind of self-interested rationality towards their group on a job site, then you can get workers to struggle for a self-interested change in the rule set of the game. And then eventually you can get workers to self-interestedly change the game. And that there's some sort of scaling up from the shorter term rationality to the longer term rationality, that workers have to be practiced in battle through some kind of workers' movement in order to scale up to being able to change the game. Now, I, you know, I don't know whether to endorse this model or not, but to be more optimistic, perhaps teleological, maybe if you believe in workers' rationality to enact communism, you start from where are the sectors of workers and what occupations do they have that give them, you know, X and Y, like, kind of outlooks on things. And this could be the basis for the differentiated appeals that you need to help those workers realize their interests. Even on the, on the moves of the game level that we find a lot less inspiring than changes in the rules of the game or changes in the game overall. Well, let's take this with a real world example that's happening right now. Like yet another Amazon factory was recently Mm -hmm. unionized. That is still focusing on the moves that you can make within the rules of the game as it currently exists. But that, like having workers see their collective self-interest in the moves they can make within the game is a starting point that is refreshing and exciting, actually. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, the stuff like about, say, you know, what's that, is it, uh, what's the coffee shop that's uh, really Starbucks. Right, There's Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah. You know, like you have this dynamic where it, the biggest, hardest thing to do is to get the first Starbucks unionized and it will generally fail, 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 fail. And then it succeeds. And then people will go, oh, wait a second, lads. There's something here. And then the next one might take mightn't fail as many times. And then you get this cascading effect where you have like now hundreds and hundreds. And every time it goes up to vote, they're winning like 24-1 and 17-3. And it, it's like sometimes it's it's literally example. It's literally like sacrifice an example that al- allows people to shift how they act in the mm-hmm. rules, in their micro classes. And, you know, I, I think... It's an impossibility for any type of a communist horizon without a working movement. Whether the movement that we have that will come out of this one has any revolutionary elements or not, like it's just a tautology that you can't go from capitalism to communism without like workers realizing their power at any point prior to this. There is a possibility of getting too hung up on making moves within the game. Right. Or there's a possibility of getting too hung up on changing the rules of the game uh, and never making it, you know, beyond those levels, let's say. But, you know, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a defense mechanism. It's something that helps you for a certain period of time that builds you up to a certain point. And then you have to kind of move on. You have to like move, move towards something else. You, right. you know, it's, it's a, the moves that you can make in the game are a good place to start for defending yourself and are a necessary beginning. Well, uh, it- but you don't want to end there. Let's think. Let's think right. strategically too. Like, what is what is, a, what is the next logical move on the next level? Right, the next level of changing the rules of the game. What are the rules of the game that prevented people from being able to challenge the game itself? That let those labor bills that I was talking about that 
made it illegal to be a communist or an anarchist in the union. Or just to do changing any, that any kind law. of radical unionism with solidarity strikes and that sort of thing. Right. Like the, just strikes. What, what can you do to change the rules to make it easier to challenge the game itself? So what was that act passed? It was it the thirties or whatnot in the States? Uh, Taft Hartley. Taft Hartley. Yeah. And, not the, not, not the Wagner, not the Wagner act. Um, which, which is the one that, that, I think that's that the one that made the general strike. Taft Hartley Act amended the 1935 National Labor Relations Act, prohibiting unions that's from engaging in several unfair. Okay, so that's the Wagner. Unfair labor practices among the practices prohibited by the Taft Hartley are jurisdictional strikes, wildcat strikes, solidarity or political strikes, secondary boycotts, secondary mass picketing, closed shops, and monetary donations by unions yeah. to federal political campaigns. Yeah, you know, the Wagner Act was the National uh, Labor Relations Act. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. So Taft Harley is what I was thinking of, which was an attempt to defang Wag, 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 Wagner, right? Because right? um, that essentially makes like general strikes you more or less criminalized, right? Yeah, general strikes, even just, just solidarity strikes. Yeah, solidarity just strikes, wildcard strikes. Yeah. <laughs> solidarity so like strikes are illegal everywhere, nearly. They're illegal everywhere in capitalism. So that's in like, England, so those are solidarity good. strikes are legal. But like the thing is, solidarity yeah. strikes are illegal until there are solidarity strikes right. and then no one can do a fucking thing about it. Yeah. But it's, right. it's ultimately, big... it's something to hold over labor union leaders to be like, oh, you can't do this. And they're like, yeah, I guess we can't. Whereas it, when they do it anyway, like they're not going to arrest every union. Mate. But it's probably a great example of something of like where it's like you might start off having a very sectoral interest, you know, improving your moves within the game, which could ultimately lead you to pursue the, you know, like changing the rules of the game in the sense of like, oh yeah, that's not a very good, that's not a very good act. But if you were to challenge that act, right, in a serious way, it would it would necessarily alter your capacity to to at least think about changing the game itself, right? It would be very like it would be very hard to have that type of radical revolutionary activity with with those rules in place. Right. So yeah, there is like and, an interesting series of the laws. Like, because uh, the progressive movement, you know, whatever the progressive movement, I, I call it a movement, but it's not the classical progressive movement, you know, just a sort of disparate, pro, you know, progressive blogosphere that was around the 2000s. You know, the Taft Hartley Act was something on a lot of people's minds because, in a way, okay, this is what hold back, holds back organized labor. God, the golden age of New Deal was all built on organized labor. Maybe if we lobby hard enough to Congress, we can overturn the Taft-Hartley Act or something. And as it turns out, without something like independent workers' power, it it's appears impossible. to be completely fucking impossible. Yeah, and I don't even go further. Like, like the thing that will actually get rid of it won't be probably political reform. It will be kind of semi-revolutionary behavior. Like, I've just been reading, like, Rosa Luxemburg on the uh, mass strike in Russia, and you just see, like, what happened. They, you know, unions are illegal. And they just literally went everywhere in like these lightning spreading and there was just like mass strikes and like all this stuff. And they got all the union laws pretty much fucking changed for a while. You know, like that's the kind of way that in reality, worker power will, will I think, will probably manifest itself and not a load of progressive bloggers fucking saying, oh, we'll get rid of the Taft, Taft Hartley Act. You know what I mean? Right. You but know. what if Ezra Klein produces a very solid data-driven analysis? Like I'm talking, Oof. he's got charts, he's got graphs. Ooh, oh, what God. nuance! And it works for management too, if you think about it. Uh, even you know, many Marxists are guilty of this uh, that we can just you know manage our way to a new union movement. You know, the game theorists. There's a sort of controversy in game theory about this very idea. Is they assume something called common knowledge of rationality, where all actors are aware of the instrumental economic sociopathic rationality that they're supposed to follow. That is a quote ideal that is almost never met on the shop floor. <laughs> like, and if, if you could get, you know, workers to, to have, to have this common knowledge of so-called rationality, this economic sociopathic rationality by which capitalism operates, you know, it would improve. I don't know. I, I maybe I'm, and maybe I'm excessively naive. Maybe I'm idealist, but I think it would, improve the quality of worker struggles in a, in a just basic game theoretical way of that assumption would then be met and people could take moves with their interests like insight in a, in a, in a you know in, in the way that you know a robot marxists kind of wish they would at, at least that on the very least on the level of their everyday lives 
you know, I think you were going to say, uh, Bob, at some point that the moves that people actually have available in their lives are the moves within the game. It's the only thing you can really think through as an individual and try to carry out. Everything else requires a level of cooperation that you may or may not be able to secure. Yeah, I think th I th I think that's right, you know, and I think there might be conditions under which that level of collective cooperation is easier to develop institutionally, like socially. But I, I also suspect that moves within the game um, might play a role in, like, like might be a necessary role, like necessary yeah. step. Like you're not, you can't, you. It's like you can't get to that second level of activity from nowhere. Right, like from yeah. from abstract void of analysis, right? Like, I mean, getting getting to to change the rules of the game at this point feels about on the same level as changing the game in terms of, you know, our prospects for doing so. I mean, look at the complete like dearth of options the mainstream Democratic Party has for you know. Wait, 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 wait. Protecting wait, wait. In, 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 uh, abortion wait. rights or something, right? Like, wait now. Let, imagine the like mechanism. How big would the squad have to be, Esri, to get them to <laughs> to pass Taff Hartley? Or oh, at least twice as big. <laughs> the, to, to but, you know, like, I'm, no, I mean, like, even if you had everybody that was like the squad in, in power, it, it, like not in power, but in the Democratic Party, and there was like a, there was like 300 of them, half of them wouldn't vote for it. Well, yeah, Maybe right. Yeah, because there's no, there's no, the, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, it's very hard to imagine a path there doesn't rely on some kind of, you know, institutional workers' power, or at least some kind of very live, sudden revolutionary threat coming from either the left or some kind of terrifying populist thing that steals the socialist appeal for ultranationalism. It, yeah, it, it's almost impossible to see any concessions.